Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development at Utah Valley University. In it, we're going to be looking at Chapter 8, which is about middle adulthood. Now, again, there's actually a much longer version of this that you can download uh, the slides from uh, my Dropbox, but this is the abbreviated version that focuses especially on the material that's going to be on the exam. Okay, the first thing we want to talk about is physical development. Now, um, the idea here is that middle adulthood starts around the 40s, maybe 40 to 45, and goes through for about 20 years to maybe 60 or 65. And there's a substantial amount of inter-individual variability. So not everybody ages in the same way or the same rate. So you have, for instance, physiological changes, which is what we're talking about right here. Um, Physiological aging is defined by changes in uh, the integumentary system. That's the hair, the skin, the nails, the senses, reaction time, and lung capacity. So, for example, uh, you get obvious things like hair turns gray because there is a loss of melanin. Or, for instance, reading can become difficult because of uh, presbyopia, which is a loss of elasticity of the lens in the eye. Now, other changes can include metabolism. Uh, which goes down partly because there's a uh, change in the relative amounts of muscle and fat, and fat burns fewer calories than muscle. There's also changes in muscular mass, strength, bone density, aerobic capacity, and, and blood sugar tolerance. Now, some of these changes, uh, middle adulthood, they can be controlled or reversed through exercise or diet, which is what we see in this slide. Okay, the second thing is about health. Um, these are the things that are killing people, and um, in the in their uh, forty-five to fifty-five and fifty-five to sixty-four, and what you have here is the major health concerns of middle adulthood um, include cancer, heart disease, chronic liver disease, strokes, diabetes, and so on. Now, some of these, such as cancer and heart disease, they're 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 top killers, but they can be somewhat controlled if they're detected early. Um, and although many Americans receive preventive health care, and in many ways we have the most developed health care system, uh, the problem is that the research shows still lots of racial, ethnic, and gender differences in the occurrence and treatment of different diseases, in part because a lot of people, um, especially people who are poor and people who are minorities, sometimes lack access to health care and therefore miss the early detection and treatment that could take care of a lot of these uh, problems Early on, also men are more apt uh, than women to forego health care. Now, uh, the recommendations vary by group. Sometimes, for instance, African-American men are advised to get screenings for prostate cancer beginning at age 45. Um, and there's a lot of things that can be prevented, but they do require that you have access to health care. And we'll see how that changes um, with the Affordable Care Act. Okay, the next thing is the immune system. Um, now, the immune system, body's uh, defense against infections, other sources of disease, you knew that. Um, one of the ways the immune system combats disease is by the production of white blood cells called leukocytes, which generate antibodies, and they kill the harmful pathogens, uh, as well as worn out and cancerous body cells. Now, also, one thing that happens in the immune system is inflammation. That's another function of the system. So when an injury happens, blood vessels in the area first contract to slow the bleeding, then they dilate, get bigger. And increased blood flow to the injured area, that can bring in more white blood cells, as well as endogenously released chemicals, which can help fight off bacteria. Finally, stress suppresses the immune system, weakens it, leaving us more susceptible to infections. And stress hormones connected with anger, which is why we got this guy here who's uh, flipping out, they can constrict blood vessels in the heart, and they can, in fact, lead to a heart attack in people who are at risk. The next step here is information processing. So we want to talk about a few different things here. This chart talks about inductive reasoning, spatial orientation, perceptual speed, numeric ability, verbal ability, and verbal memory as they change from the ages of 25 to um, 88. So let's talk about, very briefly, crystallized intelligence. Now, that's a cluster of knowledge and skills that depend on accumulated information, so the information that you have, the things you know and experience, as well as awareness of social conventions and good judgment. Now, environmental factors can greatly influence crystallized intelligence, so it tends to increase with age through adulthood, 
Well, fluid intelligence, which is a lot of what we're talking about here, decreases with age. Now, that's interesting. Crystallized goes up because you it, it increases with experience, but cr fluid intelligence goes down. Fluid intelligence has a lot to do with things like processing information. So you see, for instance, one of the things that goes way down uh, from the very top left to the bottom right is perceptual speed. That slows down dramatically over time. So does um, some of the memory. I mean, a lot of these decrease and neurological factors can strongly influence fluid intelligence. Um, and so the speed with which a person can work with information and the amount of information they can hold simultaneously, that goes down. But because of the accumulation of experience, um, the crystallized information or intelligence can go up. Okay, the next one here is creative learning. This is an interesting one. It says most adults are perpetual learners. And um, the term here they're using is mature learners. We talk about non-traditional students here at the university. Mature learners, people who return to school um, after many years out. Now, they're usually highly motivated and often find the subject matter more interesting than younger students for a number of reasons. Um, women make up the majority of older college students. And a lot of times that's because they had to take time off for families um, and still encounter time constraints due to family and to work demands because a lot of students are both working and taking care of families. Now, one of the unfortunate things is that uh, when uh, women who are returning to school to get their degree, you know, they get their jobs, uh, a substantial number of educated women still encounter the um, glass ceiling in professional work, which means that there is a gender discrimination that makes it very difficult to advance above a certain level. Um, that being said, um, there's more grown-up or mature learners going to college today than in the past. And, you know, it can be a little difficult to for an older person to adapt to an environment dominated by young people. On the other hand, the views of mature learners can help make a better educational setting, especially because we talked about the importance of being able to listen to people with uh, different points of view. And at the, the difference in experience can make um, can have an impact on that. Okay, we're going to talk very briefly about uh, Robert Havinghurst's um, developmental tasks for middle adulthood. Now you see it includes things like helping our children establish themselves in the outside world. Of course, that's assuming you have children. Um, one of these I wanted to talk about is uh, near the bottom. Let's see here. It's talking about work, keeping our performance at work at a satisfactory level. That's one, two, three, four, number five. Um, the, the thing is, this is an important part for most middle-aged people, especially those who have been employed. And it turns out this is associated with why middle-aged adults who become employed often have lower psychological health compared to younger adults. It's, it's hard because it is one of your major things that you're trying to work on. Also, it's, it's worth pointing out that this list has a few you know, issues it, because it doesn't allow really for uh, same-sex couples, childless couples, single people, or people who don't undertake the quote-unquote meaningful social or civic responsibilities. Now, so it seems a little pessimistic, um, and uh, but you can take it as a starting point. Now, this one, midlife crisis. Now, specifically here, we want to talk about uh, fertility. And um, once upon a time, um, women who were 35 years old were told to stop taking birth control pills for the idea that you know they wouldn't be able to have children any longer um interestingly people seem to be having children later um or you can worry about the side effects so 35 was sort of like seen as a midpoint in a person's life now it uh, seems to be 40. um on the other hand we can talk about 50. 50 is a significant one, especially if you're talking about childbearing, because many women around 50 um, are going through perimenopause. They have irregular periods. Their, uh, their body is transitioning to menopause. Um, and for what it's worth, a significant percentage of women in their 50s, 50 to 59, become sexually inactive for the very simple reason that they've gotten divorced or widowed and lost their partner for one reason or another. Okay, now let's talk about personality. Now, these five personality factors are known as the big five, um, the extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and openness to experience, uh, neuroticism being seen as the flip side of emotional uh, stability. Um, 
our personalities tend to mature as we age. Now, um, for the most part, okay, this is going to sound contradictory. For the most part, they stay the same, but agreeableness, conscientiousness, and emotional stability tend to increase from early to middle adulthood. Now, um, extroversion and openness to new experience, which by the way, is contrasted with uh, shallowness and a lack of perceptiveness, those either remain stable or may decline slightly in middle adulthood, which may suggest greater stability or what they're referring to here as maturity. Okay, grandparenting. Um, interesting term here is the sandwich generation. And these are people who are caring both for their own children and for their parents. And so having to split their demands. What's interesting about this is there's cultural variations in who the sandwich person actually is going to be. So for instance, um, in the United States and Canada, it's usually a daughter who's going to care for the, uh, you know, the aging parents. So a middle-aged daughter is going to do that sort of like we see here. Um, in other cultures, for instance, places like China or India, it's, uh, well, especially China, it's common to have the elderly parents live with the son. So here it tends to fall to the daughter, there it tends to fall to the son. Um, and in those societies, like China, sons are expected to put their children first, their parents second, and their wives, unfortunately, in the third place. Now, th things are going to change as there is increased uh, communication and commercialization between cultures. But that is a general pattern. And it does talk about some of the challenges that are specific to uh, middle adulthood. Anyhow, that is it for this particular lecture. And thanks for listening.